Thank you very much, Vivian. I have a dream. My dream is that young people all over the world will spend more time watching nature, you don't need a face mask, watching nature and less time watching electronic screens. And I don't just mean young people. I mean their parents, I mean their families, I mean the whole of society. Uh, spending more time in nature and less time on electronics, it will be not only better for these people and their bodies, it will be better for nature because it will raise consciousness. This has been the story of my life, watching nature. I uh, uh, was serious from the age of 12. I uh, w had my first bird list then when I was 12 years old, and I went, out, I went home from school and uh, did art every, every day from then on. These are the birds in our backyard where I grew up in Toronto. Um, and uh, I, I did them when I was 14 in 1944, and I'm still at it. Uh, this is what I'm working on currently, 70 years later, and I, uh, this year I'm going to be 84. Uh, I work on a whole bunch at once because I get really discouraged. I like them when I first start, and then they always get worse. And so I keep starting <laughs> new ones to cheer me up <laughs> until, <laughs> until it occurs to me what I'm going to do for my, uh, my next one. Uh, this one didn't give me so much trouble. It was uh, it's called uh, Dragonflies and Daylilies. And I, uh, I spent a, a bit of time, of course, <laughs> doing it, but I wanted to give you a quote. It's one of the favorite quotes I've read recently from the, I'm sure, the preeminent woman artist in history, Georgia O'Keeffe. She said, nobody sees a flower, really. It takes time to see a flower. Like to have a friend takes time. Isn't that nice? Well, I took time to see those flowers, believe me. Uh, every petal was special. Uh, every petal had its own personality, and the petals kept changing. Well, not only from day, they're not called daylilies for nothing. <laughs> and uh, and I, I took a good look at the dragonflies as well. Uh, did you ever look a dragonfly in the eye? Grandma, what big eyes you have. <laughs> the better to see mosquitoes, my dear. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> I spent a bit of time on this polar bear. The allegory I was using was a cannon, a, a killer. That's what polar bears are. But I really got involved with the fur. Uh, I wasn't interested in every hair. I don't paint every hair. I'm interested in the air in the hair. And I'm interested in the muscles and the um, bones and so on underneath the hair. And I wanted to reflect that. And every square inch of that polar bear is special. The fur on the top of the neck is different from the fur on the bottom of the neck. The fur around the ear is different from the fur around the eye. In fact, everything in nature is special and different. And it's dynamic, it's changing all the time, if we only opened our eyes to see it. Uh, this is me as a, a young uh, school teacher when I first started teaching, was in the mid-1950s. And just to put me in historic perspective, that was the year that Elvis Presley was first on television on the Ed Sullivan Show. <laughs> the grade 10 girls were impossible. <laughs> 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 on Monday morning. <laughs> and I told him, I gave him a very sage piece of advice. I said, listen, in another 10 years, you will have never heard of Elvis Presley again. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> you can believe every word I say. And by the way, <laughs> th they showed Elvis Presley from the waist up. That's what it was like back in those days. But I saw something beginning then. We started to form a new species. This, by the way, was the beginning of uh, big advertising on TV, 1956. Uh, the first big promotion to teenagers, I mean advertising to a teen market, uh, came from uh, Colonel Tom Parker, Elvis' um, manager. And uh, by 1957, a year later, he'd made $22 million on Elvis stuff, selling it to teenagers. And so we created a new species that I call Homo sapiens teenager consumerensis. And this species is trained to be as self-indulgent as possible. Imagine that, uh, creating a whole section of society on your most vital age, say from 10, and now it seems to be from 5, until 25. Your main role in society is to go shopping and be self-indulgent. And it's worked beautifully, worth billions and billions of dollars. We started raising kids on Saturday morning cartoons. This started in the mid-50s. And we now have several generations. In fact, uh, those same teenage girls uh, who are going gaga over Elvis are now, many of them are now grandmothers. Think of it. There's been several generations who've been bred to look at screens and find reality in the screen world. 
instead of reality in the real world. But that doesn't apply to all teenagers by any means. Uh, in fact, I've never known more wonderful, um, uh, productive teenagers than are alive right now. Uh, take one example, Simon Jackson. He heard that the spirit bear, when he was 14, he heard the spirit bear was uh, endangered. That's the white bear up the coast of BC. And he uh, got rock stars and pop stars all organized, formed the Spirit Bear Coalition, and now the Spirit Bear has been more or less saved. There are thousands of great kids out there, and I bet a lot of you know them. Um, and there are more every year. And they're using uh, screens and electronics um, and Facebook and all that kind of thing to for betterment of the world, for betterment of society. However, <coughs> that doesn't necessarily apply to the majority. I'm told the average... North American uh, teenagers spend seven hours a day, seven days a week, they don't take the weekend off, <laughs> looking at some kind of screen. Seven hours a day. And what's on the screen? That's, that's the key. What's on the screen? Um, is it light web or is it dark web, as, Ra as Rafi says? Um, I'm afraid often they're feeding their faces with junk food for the body and feeding their brains with junk food for the soul. Um, the... Uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that you, that you might find feeding into their brains. Uh, I had fun doing this painting. <laughs> uh, this, is known as, this is known as teenage entertainment. <laughs> Vampires, zombies, walking dead, blowing away people with bullets for fun, and explosions. Why are there so many explosions? Explosions everywhere. And you get Armageddon and apocalypse and dystopia is being fed into kids' brains and all of these things uh, actually increase your uh, stress hormones, it's increase uh, all of those kind of negative things and fear inside you, which I don't think is good for your health, either for your body or for your brain, to have a, be in a constant state of fear. Little minds are interested in the extraordinary, like that last picture. Great minds in the commonplace. Are we building a world full of little minds where the majority are full of... How are they going to vote? What kind of stories are they going to tell their grandchildren? About the good old days of Grand Theft Auto? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> this is a uh, 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 Cowichan elder who lives on Vancouver Island, not far from where we live, on Salt Spring Island. Uh, he said something very wise last year. He said, we've been talking about what kind of world are we leaving for our children. We need to start talking about what kind of children are we leaving for our world? Instead of fear, I think kids should be putting love into their heads and follow in the footsteps of E.O. Wilson, the emeritus professor at Harvard, who's the great biodiversity guy. He wrote a book called Biophilia, and biophilia means being in love with living things. Have kids fall in love with a nearby woodlot or forest uh, and instead of filling their heads with fear. Taking time to see the mystery in ordinary things is where you find the magic. That's our son Robbie when he was little. This is our son Robbie and his older brother Christopher in my painting Tadpole Time. And they've just come back from collecting frog's eggs. It takes time to see frog's eggs grow into tadpoles and grow into frogs. But it's well worth it. The Bible of our movement, I think you could, could say, is Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. And uh, I didn't realize until I'd read this book, because I live in a bubble of different kind of people, I guess, um, that uh, parents are afraid to let their kids play outside. When I say that, I often see audiences nod. Yes, they are. Well, that is crazy. I always played outside with my buddies, and I bet you did too. I have never heard of a group abduction <laughs> in history, except for the Pied Piper of Hamlin, and he's fiction. <laughs> so playing outside is not where the big threat is. Inside is where the big threat is. We don't need adult supervision outside. We need some, of course, when they're toddlers. But we need a lot of adult supervision inside. Those grandmothers who grow up on screens think it's perfectly safe having kids looking at screens. They don't care what they're looking at. That can be very dangerous. Have you ever heard of internet predators? 
Have you ever heard of internet pornography? Ever heard of cyberbullying? That's where it's dangerous. That's where it needs supervision. But outside, what we need are free-range kids, like these free-range chickens of ours. And here's a couple of free-range free granddaughters uh, sitting on top of a cliff, cousins, uh, Ruby and Lily. I looked up from my painting one day, and there they were perched on top of the cliff. I didn't go, oh, horrors, they're, un they're not supervised. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have common sense. They're not going to fall off the cliff. And they're just having a good time as cousins ch uh, chatting together. You cannot build resilience in young people without taking risks. You cannot build resilience without taking risks. There's a um, practice in Japan now called forest therapy, or sometimes forest bathing. And what they do, they take uptight office workers from downtown Tokyo. <laughs> and if there's anybody uptight, it's an office worker from downtown Tokyo, <laughs> and, uh, or Yokohama or whatever. And all they do is go for a walk in the woods. That's all they do, no other treatment. For under an hour, they just go walking in the woods and um, they find their cortisol level comes down, their fight or flight hormones, which all those horrible teenage entertainment increases. They find their uh, immune system improves, their blood pressure goes down, and their acuity improves. And after less than an hour, they'll go, they go back into the office, way more efficient workers. It really pays. Nature is magic. Now there are neuroscientists doing studies of this and they're finding that, that plants off-gas, um, they, they breathe aromatics that our cells evolve for and our cells rejoice. And uh, I'm going to take a second rate now. I want you all to take a breath and think about pine trees. I bet it had a good effect. Uh <coughs> Now the kids uh, uh, that were growing up at the in Fulford Harbor, British Columbia, Fulford Harbor area where we uh, sent our kids to school and our grandkids still go there, before they had uh, money for the swing sets and all the man-made uh, playground stuff, the kids just played in this little bit of uh, just kind of ordinary nature. Very comp complicated but ordinary. And they climbed trees and they jumped across the creek and they made little dams and so on. Then they got the, uh, the budgets for the, the man-made stuff and the kids went and played there. And the principal at the time, it was really interesting, said it was amazing and quite sudden. The kids' behavior went down. There was more bullying, less attentiveness in class. In, in every way, the kids' behavior was worse when they played on the man-made stuff. And in fact, in Toronto and all kinds of cities in North America, and I guess in the Western world, they're jackhammering up schoolyards now and putting wildernesses back in. And the kids love to play on it, and it's actually statistically way safer than playing on the man-made stuff, far, far fewer injuries. Birgit and I, uh, my wife Birgit and I, when we were teachers, uh, used to uh, go on canoe trips. Um, and we found uh, during the course of a one-week or maybe a two-week canoe trip, the, uh, the kids, uh, well, there's, <laughs> there's always two or three kids, usually boys, who are idiots or yahoos at the beginning. <laughs> of the trip, <laughs> and they're causing trouble. By the end of the trip, almost invariably, those kids became caring human beings. As I said, nature is magic. Uh, they would be helping the weak ones over the portages. And we know now there are lots of programs taking problem kids, difficult kids, out on wilderness trips, and it always works. Nature, as I said, is magic. Now, you don't need budgets to go on canoe trips. You can just take the kids for a walk uh, I talked to a grade three teacher, and she just would take the kids out when she has a chance and just go walking down the sidewalk. And you're bound to see a dandelion. <laughs> There's tons of stuff you can talk about and, and pause and think about it. I guess you know the word for dandelion came from the French, dent de lion. That's the teeth of a lion. And you just take a look at the leaves and you can see where that comes from. Or you can play with the, make little parachutes out of the. There's tons of stuff, which I don't have time to talk about <laughs> in the dandelions. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. But don't forget, teaching does not just take place in schools. Maybe that's the least of where teaching takes place. Teaching takes place from your peers. Teaching takes place from all these screens, for sure. <coughs> and so we have to make sure that we are taught the things that are going to move us forward in a good way. So if my dreams come true, I would have 
more people, well, everybody in the world, taking time, taking a little bit of time, it could be five minutes, every opportunity to get out into nature, just to go and play around the leaves for five minutes and go back inside again, or five days or five weeks. Taking more time to go out into nature and spending less time on the screen. That's what the world would be like if my dreams came true. And I want to close with a statement from that well-known 20th century philosopher, John Lennon. <laughs> he said, some may call me a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Fellow dreamers, thank you. <laughs>